is the jail and the 911 communication. That's slide five. Slide six very briefly outlines the steps of, of the study that were underway. Um, condition of the building and the need for beds, jail beds. Uh, phase two was development of an architectural space program and then a number of options that I'll explain to you this evening. And as the big uh, blue uh, box indicates that, this is the point that we're at tonight. We're, we've completed phase one and phase two. And at some point here within the next month or so, um, I, I think we will be coming back to the board uh, looking for a recommendation to approve going into phase three. And that's the recommendation that we'll see here in just a minute. So if I go turn the page and go to slide eight, um, and um, you can follow with me, the safe, safety facility study group is recommending that the county board accept the phase two recommendation, which will be uh, labeled option seven and approve funding to move into phase three of schematic design. Now that approval is simply to allow us to go into the next design phase. That does not fund the project. That would come at a later date. So there's opportunity going forward at many steps to discuss and debate this project. Um, so then slide nine, um, why are we here tonight? Why a new safety building? Um, and this portion of the presentation is, is a high level, rec high level presentation. There'll be more detailed as we get into the discussion tonight. There are really four reasons. Uh, I've alluded to this a moment ago, that the physical condition of the safety building is a major issue here. And we'll get into more detail of that. The current design, which is the jail design, has a real impact, an adverse impact on jail operations. Um, Inadequate bed capacity, as some, if not all of you know, you're renting beds from other counties. Uh, a good percentage of your inmates are being housed in other places. Um, and then of course, thinking in the, into the future, that there's always a consideration for future jail bed needs as time goes on. So um, let's then get into some of the details. Slide 10. As a, as a quick overview, that physical condition that I noted, uh, because of the nature of the building and its age, a lot of the materials and systems are, are out of date. Uh, they've not been perhaps well maintained, just simply the age of the equipment, no doubt, no different than a car or a house. Um, HVAC is the mechanical systems. Um, in the winter, there are no backups, and so portions of the jail are, are inadequately heated. Fire suppression is the same as fire sprinklers, and there is no fire sprinkler system in the building, only a fire monitoring system. Plumbing, um, as I note, continuous repair and replacement. Again, it's because of the condition of the building. And then electrical and power likewise, old and out of dated. Page 11, slide 11, shows you a couple pictures. The picture on the left is the main hallway in the jail. This is what the jailers are able to see and observe the offenders, the inmates that are in jail. Literally, they cannot see what's going on in the jail without going actually into the little individual housing units. Mm -hmm. A more modern jail, and I note that the Eau Claire County, a few years ago, a project that we had done, quite a bit different in its design. So that's, we're talking about the, the impact of the physical building on jail operations. Page 12, um, specific to the housing component of the jail, um, the design is, in, is inadequate primarily because of the number, of the, the lack of beds. A classification is something that the state requires between male and females, uh, minimum, medium, and maximum classifications. That's not possible in the jail. 
work release or the Huber facilities. Um, there's a problem in contraband. People are coming into the jail with, with whatever, and there's not pro proper classification of that. And then finally, special needs beds. There, there's a, a percentage of people that are in the jail who might have uh, mental issues. They might have anger management, things like that. They need to be separated from the general population. In a jail small as this one is, there's just not that ability to separate that. So those are items related to housing. Page 13 talks about the support areas and I won't read them all, but I think you get a flavor of the discussion. It's simply that the, the building is, a, because of its age and its design, it's just not adequate to provide the, the, uh, the support that's required for the jail. Um, page 14, we turn the page. Um, 911 communication is in the jail. Um, that's your dispatch. And um, it's really because of its design and the fact that it's located in the jail, it actually serves as master control for the jail. Um, and as I note in the, in the uh, notes here, master control and dispatcher should not be combined. And in a, in, a, in a new facility, they would be separate functions. So, you know, when an issue comes up in the jail and you've got a call coming in, the question is, who do you go to first? Do you deal with the issue in the jail or do you call? You take care of the call? Um, slide 15, ADA is American Disabilities Act. Uh, as noted, many areas in the jail do, are not in compliant. And I've added a couple of pictures here that will share that, that point with you. Slide six, any questions as I'm going along? Is this going at a decent pace? Are we okay? Too Very slow, good. too fast? Very good. Okay. I practiced um, several times. So slide 16, we've been talking about the jail. Let's talk a little bit about the sheriff's area. Um, as I noted there, it's in the basement of the jail. Um, there's some things that could vastly be improved. Uh, I note here that the staff area is poorly laid out. I think for the staff to complete their functions and services, um, the layout and the distractions are, are quite significant. Some of the support areas like meeting rooms are too small. There's some issues with acoustical privacy in some of the meeting rooms. You can hear through the walls. And so if you're doing interviews or interrogations and things like that, I mean, there's just the physical condition of the building and there's no dedicated uh, staff break room. So we're, we're gonna jump then to the third item, which is inadequate jail bed capacity. As I note, does not meet the present and future bed needs. The present jail uh, has a what's called a, a rated capacity of 22 beds. That's what the state determines is the capacity of the jail. Now there's also a term called design capacity and I note 85%. I, I referred earlier to this topic called classification where you have to separate people, male, female, minimum, medium, maximum. Um, to do that, you literally, the jail ends up being full at 85% or thereabouts because you, you always end up with some beds that you can't use because you can't put the same people of different classifications into the same housing area, if that, if that, if that makes sense to you. Um, when we did the, the, I'll be honest with you, when we did this part of the study, the average daily population was at 41. Sheriff, where are you at? Where are you at today? if I might ask. So right now with um, the measures that we've taken because of COVID-19, uh, we've done some creative things with the judge, with the district attorney, and we put people out on furlough. We've increased our use of electronic monitoring. Um, and there has been absolutely no court uh, going on as well. So our numbers are, are relatively low. We're probably standing somewhere in the low 20s, high teens, mostly just because everything is literally shut down. Um, and because we're trying to eliminate the potential for spread, we again had to take some creative actions. But once this is over and our justice system fires back up again, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna go right back up to where we were. But for right now, for the sake of you know just getting through these uh, these challenging times, we were able to take some action. So I would estimate that on any given day, it's in the low twenties. Okay. Um, COVID nineteen has had an incredible uh, incredible. That's not the right word. It's had um, a major impact on jails around not only Wisconsin but around the country. Um, 
in an effort to try to separate people, move people out of the jail. Um, judges have been very lenient. Uh, Law enforcement has been very lenient. They're not putting people in jail as much as they were. And I think that's some of the reason why your population is low. Um, I asked this question of all of our county clients, such as Kiwani, and they're all pretty much saying as, as what the sheriff is saying is that this is a sort of a, a drop, if you will. But when things get back to normal, we're probably gonna be back up to where we were. Now, one can debate that. Um, and I'm sure there will be a debate on that at some point with respect to the size of this jail facility, but it is certainly, you cannot deny that COVID-19 hasn't had an impact on jails, um, not only in its size, but also in its design. And I won't get into the details tonight, but um, it's a major design consideration. And frankly, your jail just can't address the COVID-19 issues that we're dealing with. Um, so I mentioned the 41. Um, I've, I've noted already that this issue of inmate classification, um, and I should note also that because of that male-female difficulty in the existing jail, all your female inmates, at least at the time that we did this part of the study, were being shipped out to other counties. So um, whether that's right or wrong, uh, oftentimes when people are shipped out, they lose any opportunity for programming or other kinds of services that they would get in their own county. So something to think about when you're shipping prisoners to another to another county there. Um, and programming, I think, is a really important issue um, in trying to eliminate recidivism and all the associated issues related to that. Um, so page 19, we're going to go into section three. This is the bed needs assessment. Um, this is the part of the study that we had a consultant come in. Rod Miller is his name, his company is CRS. Um, spent quite a bit of time in the county collecting, analyzing information. He talked with many of the stakeholders here in the county, uh, county officials, police officers, judges. Uh, I think anyone who has an issue or, and is part of the judicial system had an opportunity to talk, to talk with Rod. What his charge was, was to create an average daily population and to create a 20 year forecast. So what we're talking about in terms of the size of the jail, the numbers that I'm gonna share with you are gonna be larger than what you currently have, but that's the point. The point is to plan a jail, build a jail that can last for 20, 30, 40 years. So you're not having to go back through this whole process again at some point, 10 years from now, if you will. So um, on slide 21, just to note a few other things that Rod did. Um, in his assessment of the jail population, he did identify a variety of factors that could certainly impact the future of jail bed needs. Um, there, is, uh, there is a discussion in the country about uh, eliminating bail. That's a possibility. Um, how the state deals with their probation offend the parole offenders is a big issue in many counties. So there are these unknown issues that can could affect, bring the population down, they could spike the population. It's part of that real uncertainty as you begin to think about the size of the jail. Those are the factors. Um, on a side note, he offered a number of policies and practices that the county could in initiate that would also address some of the issues related to the jail and its population. And one of those was to create a county criminal justice coordinating council. Um, and I think that's an excellent recommendation. So if I go to the next page, some of those statistics, um, the population of the jail has increased by 49% since 2009. So that's, that's a real something to really to think about. Um, it's not that the jail population is flat, but it con continues to grow. Um, and overall that average is 4.9%, actually quite high. Slide 23, and we get into the actual numbers. What Rod is recommending for that 20 years is a population of, of 61.4, um, 61 inmates. But then he applies a number of other factors to that number and he came up with 82 beds. Um, and I'll explain, I'll give you a better answer to the 82 when we get into the actual uh, jail planning design because it, I'll, I'll save it until then. So 82 is the magic number today. So then um, section four, 
is, is going to go into a lot more detail to the things that I've just described. So I don't know if I will go through it as in a great detail. I think you can easily read what, what, what I have on these slides, but this is more backup information to what you just saw. So slide 25 talks about the fit more about the physical condition of the safety building. You can see the pictures. Again, I encourage you to tour the building at some point. Um, 26 talks about the mechanical systems that I noted earlier. 27 talks again about the fire protection or the fact that there's no uh, fire monitoring or that we have only fire monitoring. There are no sprinklers in the building. Um, again, as we're going through here. If you have questions, please feel free to stop me. Um, plumbing, the, the issue here is that stuff is just old. It's out of date. Um, drainage problems, repair and replacement, parts that are not available anymore. Um, lighting, electrical, slide 29. A lot of issues related to the, the original design, the original fixtures. Slide 30 talks about power. Um, some of these things were, and there's a much deeper report that uh, I make, our electrical engineer and mechanical engineer put together for these, and that can certainly be shared with, with any of you if you want more detailed background information. We talk about slide 31, the fire alarms, video surveillance, access control. Again, I don't want to go too quickly, but um, some of this gets to be really boring. Is it boring? Um. No. <laughs> So let's get let's get to the good stuff. Um, action plans. This is slide 32. Um, a little bit of background. Uh, slide 33. Um, two little red boxes. There is towards the bottom is the courthouse, the safety building um, in downtown uh, uh, Kiwani. And then, as many of you know, all of you know that a, a mile and a half up the road you have a metal building that the, the county acquired a number of years ago. And in that building is your, your sheriff's fleet, the armory uh, vehicle impound. Those would be vehicles that have been in accidents um, related to evidence, ev evidentiary information. You have workout training and evidence storage is all up in, in that building. So just a little back, background as to what you currently have. So slide 34. And, and at this point in the study, this is all part of phase one study where phase one identified the needs for the facility. And then we started to identify the, the many different options that the county might want to consider going forward. And you'll see that there's seven of them. And you'll see at the far right, uh, three of them were removed pretty immediately. And that then going into phase two, we were taking Four are the options, option one, option four, five, and seven. So I'm not, I, I can read them, you can read them as yourself. Option one was to abandon the jail, just get out of the business. Option two was simply to try to remodel the public safety building. Option three was to uh, put an addition and remodel it on site, keeping the existing building. Uh, both of those were removed from consideration. The new jail only on new jail only on the site is something we'll we'll talk about tonight. That was four. Five was a new safety building, um, which would then include the sheriff and the 911. We studied that. Six was a new jail only on an off-site location, the TBD to be determined. And then option seven, uh, a new safety building. And so as I had noted at the very beginning, we'll see at the end, the recommendation is for option seven. So a little bit of background on that very briefly. And the slides that the next slides I'll show you came out of the phase one. So I won't go into great detail. I apologize if I had a big screen, I could point my wand and give you some better ideas to what we're talking about. But op option one again was to abandon the jail and I'm on slide 35. The dashed, red dashed line is the jail. So that would be uh, eliminated. And then uh, you're, you're basically out of business in that regard. Uh, I won't go through the advantages and disadvantages. You can read that at your leisure. Um, option four, again, one that we studied uh, in more detail, and I'll go, go through that in a few minutes, was to build just the jail, a housing pod on, on the site with the jail support. 
That's slide 36. Um, slide 37 and 38 and 39, I want to digress for just a moment I, and talk a little bit about jail design. I, I made the comment that the current jail is what we call a linear jail. There's a hallway. It's linear. You walk down the hallway and there are these little rooms off to the side that you can't see in. What you'll see in slide 37 is, and the, I guess the key word is called pod, podular. So it's kind of like a, a wagon wheel. The red is the officer, and all the purple are the are the cells, and they they, are, they radiate around the perimeter of the jail. And so from that one position, then the officer can see pretty much everything in the pod, and that's the, the podular design. And again, without getting into the details of this little diagram, all those lines that um, radiate off of that middle point, oh, those are solid walls. So you can have that classification that I talked about. You can have male and female and minimum and medium and maximum all within that same housing pod. So I don't want to get into any more detail with that, but that's kind of the idea. If you look at slide 38, this is a, a actual a computer generated uh, model diagram of a project we're doing in Iowa. It's Dallas County, kind of gives you a three dimensional understanding briefly of what that pod might look like. And then slide 39 is kind of a sample view. This is all computer generated of what that officer off to the right can actually see from that officer station inside. So there's a really a fundamental difference in its design from the linear. So I, I won't go into any more detail on that. I'm gonna to go to slide 40. This was option five where we talked about a new safety building on site. Um, that was option five. And then option seven was a new safety building um, on, a, on a site still to be determined. So that, that's just a quick overview. That was part of phase one. And I'm realizing as I go through this and uh, actually putting this together, there's gonna be a little bit of overlap and I apologize, but I wanted to make sure that everyone understood the work that was part of phase one. And so we're essentially, we finished phase one at that point. We didn't put any budgets together. We just had the options. So page 42 really begins the phase two where we start to look at more detail, budget numbers, et cetera, um, a more deeper dive into the options. So um, let me then walk you through these. So option number one, as you recall, is to abandon the jail and simply rent beds from adjoining counties. So 43 kind of gives you a, a quick overview of what that means. It means that inmates are shipped to other counties. Sheriff's department still remains in the courthouse. That doesn't change. Um, the existing jail could be demolished for additional parking on the courthouse site, that, that would work. And then 911, because the jail is being torn down, we have to find a new place in the county government for 911. That's one of the things that comes with option one. Um, slides 44 and 45 talk about, well, where are these inmates gonna go? Uh, we talk about ending the jail. Um, and so this little map gives you some sense as to those counties that are in close proximity to uh, Kiwani and um, w those counties that might be available to house prisoners. Um, right now you're having prisoners in Door County. I believe that's the only county sheriff, is that right? Okay. But I think as we as we talked about that, and, and maybe perhaps share if you can lend a little more clarity, uh, more detail to these two slides. We talked in the in the committee that um, some of the things that we need to think about is that many of the counties that could uh, and are in pro close proximity just don't have the capacity to take prisoners. Is one consideration, the Marinettes, the Shawnos, Wapaka, et cetera. And then the other consideration is that the cost to transport prisoners, um, if you are transporting to an adjoining county, then you, you can do that with only one officer. 
If you have to go beyond that, then I believe it's two officers. Is that right? So there is a cost associated with that, an additional cost. Um, slide 46, some, uh, 46 and 47 talk more about some of the impact of, of this particular option. Um, I'm on 46, uh, new arrests to be booked out of the county. It impacts all local police departments. See, now you don't, you don't have a jail anymore. Um, additional staff would be required to transport inmates to these adjoining counties, as well as back and forth to court. Some of that does happen through electronic video, video conferencing, et cetera, and that definitely has increased dramatically because of COVID-19. Um, Huber work release inmates, this is the third item. Um, it complicates their opportunity to, to do that in that regard and the strain on families. And then I noted or alluded to some time back in the presentation that when you're transporting and you have inmates that are in other counties, oftentimes the programming opportunities are non-existent. So I think there's, you know, there's certainly a consideration there. Um, slide 47 continues that discussion. Um, and as we talked in our committee that option one is available only if you can find beds to rent. Otherwise it really is kind of off the table in many respects. Um, while short-term solution, um, it, it really puts Kiwani County's future in other hands. Um, mm -hmm. There's no guarantee that beds would be available. Um, you're kind of first come, first serve. Um, if they want you gone, you're gone. Um, there's some probation reimbursement benefits that are lost. And, and as I think the sheriff's staff noted on slide 47, that if, if someday you were to go back into the jail business, um, you know, staff training and all those other things to, to kind of go back into that business would become more problematic. Any questions for me or the sheriff on option number one? Because this is an option that we're saying we're not, we're not gonna talk about it anymore, okay? Option four is the first of three options where we're actually talking about construction. So option four, um, this is a 52 bed jail. And this is where I wanna explain a little bit about sizes of jails. Um, the, the, the recommendation is to build a jail that has the capacity for 52 beds, but with the sizing of the jail cell, the state will allow us to double those cells. And that allows us to take a 52 bed jail and actually have the capacity and time to, to actually house 85 individuals. So it's, maybe it's a wordsmith. Is it an 85 bed jail or is it a 50, 52 bed jail? I guess it depends upon your point of view, I suppose, in that regard. Um, but that's, that's what this recommendation is. Um, it's a three-story building built on the site of the existing jail. Sheriff's department stays in the courthouse. I'm reading off of slide 48. And there's a connection between the jail and the courthouse. Um, to be fair to this option, and against compared to other options, particularly option seven, where parking would be provided adequately on an off-site off location, um, acquiring property around the courthouse for, for that needed parking for the sheriff staff, et cetera, um, might well be a, a requirement from option number four. So you have a little diagram on page 49, and we dropped this little diagram of a new jail onto the site. It takes the place of the existing jail and the parking that's behind that. Um, slide 50 talks a little more graphically about just diagrammatically what that jail might look like. I won't go into the details of that, but there's the podular design that I noted before. Slide 51 um, begins to talk about costs so that all of this for this option four, it's capital cost and the plan would be that it would be bid pretty much this time next year, 2021. The construction cost is just shy of 19 million. There are other uh, non-construction related costs uh, uh, that I estimate at roughly 18%. These are fees, permits, 
uh, contingency dollars, movable equipment, telecommunications, things that are not built into the bricks and mortar of the building. That's 18%. There are temporary costs during construction. Um, we have a jail that's no longer. We have to transport prisoners. We have to pay for those prisoners. Uh, everybody's out of the jail now. Um, there's some details that can be provided for those numbers if, if needed. And so that's the total, total project cost of approximately 26 million. Because the study is really a study at this point, um, I asked the uh, Concord group to give me a range of numbers. So um, option four is what 24.7 to 27.4, just a range. So that is um, the cost for option four. And there'll be a summary page here in a minute that you can see all the numbers together. There are, um, in, in an effort to try to break down some of those costs, slide 52 simply identifies the things that are included in the construction cost. And then slide 53 uh, likewise continues, continues that as well. And then uh, slide 54 talks about those other costs that I noted before. This is slide 54, and this will apply to all the options, the contingency dollars, the professional fees, surveys, testing, so on and so forth. Um, more information on option four. The recommendation is to remove this from consideration, primarily because uh, additional staff uh, due to the multi-level design, it's a three-story building. The site doesn't allow the county to really grow any further with the jail. We'll find that the similar costs for option one during construction are the same and the same staffing, et cetera. So option four was likewise removed. Option five is um, another concept at the um, same site. I should, I should back up for a moment. Option four was strictly the jail. And option four said that the sheriff's office stayed in the side of the courthouse. Option five is going to propose both the new jail, the 52 bed jail, as well as the new sheriff's office. So then a lot of the same information that we saw in option four, just um, some different numbers because the scope of the project is larger. So if I go to slide 59, this is the capital cost. I explained already briefly how what those numbers, how we put those numbers together. And again, you get a range of 32 to 35 and a half million for option five. Some of the comments that we uh, developed during the planning of this, this is slide 60 and 61, um, requires additional jail staff compared to what we'll talk about in option seven due to the multi-level design the site limits the future growth, I noted earlier. Um, some of the other costs are similar to option one during construction, staffing for 911, et cetera. No benefits to relocating the sheriff's department to a new jail. Um, and so then we get to option number seven, and this begins slide 61. So this is likewise as, as the other option, it's a 52 bed jail, expandable to 85 beds, Includes jail support, sheriff's department, and a new 911 communication, all in one building. Uh, the, the plan, as you'll see tonight, is to build it on the field south of the Health and Human Services building. And it is inside the city of Kiwani. It's a one-story building when compared to the other designs and the other options that were multi-leveled. That's the staffing concern. There would be parking for both the public, the sheriff, and the jail. And because of the availability of land that the, the building can be master planned so that in the future for our grandchildren, whomever, um, that the building can be expanded where the downtown site does not offer that, that opportunity. So um, I go to slide 62. We're coming down to the end here. So you'll see on slide 62, this is the, the farm field that's south of the HHS building. Um, it's really strictly a diagram at this point. The, the, you'll see the pod, the, the, the lighter green is the jail, the bluish color is the sheriff's office. The site is such that 
uh, the building can be master planned so that there could be other future construction on site. Maybe someday, not in our lifetime, but maybe someday the courthouse it will be reconsidered because of its age um, and condition so that uh, any work that's done in, in such as option seven should take into account the possibility someday in the future that a new courthouse might be built on that and thus make really a new justice center. It would be short-sighted to make that, not, not to consider that and include that as a future option. So we get to the numbers on 63 and you'll see that the project cost is 32 to 35 million. Slides 64 and 65 talk perhaps more favorably of option seven. Um, I've, I've noted many of them already. The site allows a single story construction. It's less expensive on a cost per square foot, base, cost per square foot basis. Um, the design can be maximized, it's operational efficiency because we're doing, dealing with everything that's brand new all on one level. There's the ability for expansion, as I noted before, and the fact that it's in close proximity to the HHS building. And there is, in fact, a lot of, a lot of movement back and forth between staff, or could be potentially between the existing HHS admin building and the new um, safety building. And then um, that kind of segues into 65, where we, we talk about allowing the most efficient use of county staff resources. Um, there is also, though, however, the transportation of inmates to court. Um, that does not happen now, but you know, actually across, across the parking lot. Um, though at the same time, and I, I, I noted this a few moments ago, uh, again, because of COVID-19, there's much more use of video between the courts and, and, and the jail. So that's something that's new for all of us as well. But I likewise, I note that it's the most expensive first cost. And so then when you go to 66 and you look then at those four, those three options that we talk about with the cost, you can then see the range between low and high. Um, and you'll see that option seven as a new building um, is actually tracks very closely to what was option five, trying to build on the existing, on the existing jail site. So questions and answers. What is the cost of the additional staffing under option seven? There would, there would be a legacy cost, correct? Do we know, do we have an idea? Yeah, please, yes. Yes, that is actually uh, some of our final work that we went through, and that brings us into probably another 60-page PowerPoint. Um, and so I think we want to kind of expedite it for tonight. But absolutely, staffing is a, a concern or a consideration, but in that new facility versus trying to shoehorn something onto that existing site with multi-levels, the most efficient use of staff is going to be you know, at a single level, something that's actually built for maximum efficiency. And one of the other discussions we had, so most of you know, or maybe you don't, so Kiwani County is very unique that we've always been doing this, this dual role um, staffing model, right? Where our jailers are dispatchers and our dispatchers are jailers, which as was stated, when the 911 phone rings and that jailer has to go back up the 911 operator to page fire, to page rescue, to do a mutual aid box alarm, the question then is asked, who's watching the inmates? Yeah, they're watching themselves. We've been running on this model for decades. We've saved some substantial money for decades, but it is definitely not recommended. And moving forward, we have to walk away from that option. That being said, as we start to talk about staffing, we talked about what we call static positions, those positions that are non-negotiable. And I think John struck on a little bit, we talk about master control. We can't have master control that is being um, you know, sidelined by another duty. That's gotta be a fixed focus of master control. And then you've got the pod officer. There's some fluidity there. And then you've got booking. Booking, they identify as a separate one, but again, that one has some movement. That one's not static to the booking because we could go through a shift and not have a booking. We could go through four hours or six hours and not have a booking. So, and then you look at our 911 center where you have, at a minimum, we have to have that one fixed, but typically you want to have that backup. So looking at the way that we would design this so that you are able to use your staff in the maximum efficiency, being able to float that booking officer over into dispatch um, because booking is something you can control. Even if an officer brings somebody in for booking, 
you can you can basically hold them. Say, so, you know what, get them into receiving. We'll get there when we get there. So we'll control the things we can control the pace of and thereby better utilize the, the staffing model. But yes, it is going to result in an increase of staff, not because we're overloading the staff, but because for decades we have been woefully inadequate in the staffing levels of what we've done in our jail dispatch. And that's just a fact of it. Would it be possible, what about uh, joint 911 with another county? And we have had discussions about doing that. Um, and very similar to the jail, they're not going to do that because they like us. There's going to be a cost to that. And I have had discussions with Dan Kane up in Door County. And what that would result in is at a minimum of a staffing increase. So at a minimum, they're going to have to add at least one staff they're not going to eat that cost. That will be directly transferred to us. So uh, as will all of the other supporting costs, the, you know, the, the cost of using their 911, cost of using the radio system, cost of using their spillment. So we've talked a lot about what are the costs we're incurring now? What would be the cost there? And the big thing is with the staffing model, if all we're doing is adding that one dispatch position because we're going to utilize the floating positions of the jail, then it's a wash then it's a wash. And that's what we want to make, you know, very clear as we go through our study. I'm okay. If we're saving hundreds of thousands of dollars, yeah, it's something that should be on the table. But if we're going to trip over ourselves and sell it our 911 system, and in the end, it's a wash, you know, so we've got to be realistic of what we're giving away in these relationships. Um, because in all the systems that I've seen, I used to work for Two Rivers. They, they uh, farmed that out to Manitowoc now. Uh, the different jurisdictions that have, you know, rolled it out within a county, you know, there is a change in service. There are no uh, counties of the 72 counties throughout the state of Wisconsin that have handed away or given away their 911 systems. Those always remain within a county. And I think there's an expectation within a county for the taxes we're paying that we have a county 911 system, um, you know, as well as you know, the awareness of the county, frequency, the familiarization, things of that nature. But it is something we're having a discussion on because in all of this, we wanna make sure that we do not leave any rock unturned we are going to explore and have explored every possible option. But in the end, we have to weigh being, you know, short-sighted versus long-term vision. Um, so we always want to make sure we're balancing that out because whatever money we spend, we've got to make sure we're not respending it in 10 years or in 20 years. Let's make sure that we spend it. And for our kids' sake, they're not respending it again. So we want to be able to, you know, look back a generation or two generations and then look at us and say, man, they did this right. Not what the hell were they thinking? So, you know, that's, that's where I come from. With uh, potentially having 85 beds, are we considering of renting some of our extra beds to counties? And is that profitable to rent them out? You know, absolutely. So some of the clients that we may have, we've always got probation and parole. So and it was alluded to a little bit with the justice system throughout the state. What you're seeing as a trend in the state is they want to minimize the incarceration in these state institutions, Dodge, Wapan, you know, Stanley. And so what they do it by is incorporating greater probation time which is great. That means instead of 10 years in the prison, they're doing four years or five years and the rest are serving on probation. The fun part about that is when they're released and then they have a, a subsequent violation, which unfortunately is, is a great amount of time. What facility do you think they're going to? My jail. You know, that's the, that's the other, the client that we have to work with is we've got the state. You know, it's sort of a, it's an interesting relationship, um, but that's the state. Now I have had conversations and I've got letters from Brown Door in Manitowoc, those are our closest, because as was stated, we're not just talking about long-term housing. That would be an easy one to solve. If all we were dealing with were 90-day 90, uh, 90 sentences, 120-day sentences, yeah, it'd be easy to you know, say, hey, Shawano County, you know, um, Marinette County, we're going to haul somebody up, and we don't have to see them again for 120. But we're talking about fresh arrests. We're talking about continued movement between court hearings. You know, it's, 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 a, it's a living and breathing animal, not something that's just static. But when I talk to Manitowoc County, they're in the process now of trying to see where they're going. And they and the sheriff down there said, if you guys are looking at building, we would be a client because we're hesitant as to what steps we're going to take. Brown, uh, talk to Todd Delane. They're full the minute they open the doors. Door, yeah, they'll take them, but she wants basically a 30 to a 90 day opt out. So at some point in time, I mean, they're going to take care of Door County first. And that, that's a big part of that option one that, yeah, even if we could go down that path, we're always going to be the odd person out. And when if all of a sudden they get to a point in their capacity, guess who's going to be on the outside looking in? Kiwani County. And now we're going to be scampering, trying to figure out what other county loves us. So it's a dicey, and I think it's a vulnerable position to put our, to put our community. But yes, I think there are some options for, for revenue and for outside clients. 
Matt, what is the, the average time that somebody's in our jail? Can you tell me that? So on average, it's really a funny number because, I mean, everything in the jail goes from literally a booking and release up to 365 days. And so when you run the average, um, I believe the average is somewhere in the middle of around 30 to 35 days, but you've got to put in the average, you know, 30 minutes, uh, the time it takes us to book them in, do a, do a bond or have somebody come pick them up and out the door they go. So it's a skewed number. We'd have to look at what are the typical sentences to really look at the incarceration. And all I can say is the max is 365 and the minimum will be, you know, five days, four days, and it's everything in between. Um, and that becomes pop uh, complicated because it's hard to then uh, set a course, right? It's like a business. You know, it'd be easier if you knew you were going to sell X amount of gadgets in a given week, all right? It'd be easy for us to, to be able to plan this if we knew we had X amount of people coming in on a given month. We don't. You know, we have ebbs and flows, we have spikes, and we have valleys. Um, so all we can do is work with these estimates, build for what we know the need is today, and have the vision to look out 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. So as they talked about the jail, you know, the starting point to the ending point, yeah, you're starting out with the needs up front, but you have the ability basically just through some mounting plates in the walls that are built in that when the time comes that we've, you know, creeped up, you just hang another rack, you know, and we're not having to go back to the taxpayer saying, hey, here we go again, let's put up some more concrete. So we want to be able to look forward those 10, 20, 30 years so that when we do get to those numbers, it's as easy as literally hanging a rack, we just increased our capacity. So we want to be smart about this and be able to look forward as much as we can. Yes, Linda. In the minutes, it said that the committee decided not to have a basement. What was the reason for that? You know, and that's something I don't know that's been 100% eliminated, but we looked at the pros and cons. What's the value as far as accessibility? Basements typically were used for your, for your vault, for your record storage. We're digital. I don't need, you know, to spend thousands of dollars on a hole in the ground because we want to put boxes in the, into a corner. We've gone digital. So our need for storage is very minimal. So we'd have to ask ourselves, what are we gonna put in that place that we're gonna spend you know, thousands of dollars on a hole in the ground if really there's no value to it? If there is, and, and we can justify that value, we wanna do it. But I think typically and historically, we always had basements you know, primarily for records retention. We've gone digital for over a decade now. The, record, the paper that we um, create and generate in the Sheriff's Department is minimal. So I really have no need for you know, vault, storage rooms and all that stuff. We wanna keep it at a minimum. Plus, thought, from an ADA standpoint, if you have a second level, you have to have an elevator. I thought the basement was where solitary was. <laughs> no, that's your room. <laughs> Other questions? So, Linda, um, I remember when the original jail was built, and I never was for that back then. But uh, at that time, they said that, or somewhere along the line, they said you wouldn't be able to build a second story there. And so it would this single story facility be built? I know it, there's a lot of land. Can you, can you speak in your microphone? They can't hear you up front, I'm sorry. Do you want me to repeat anything? Uh, probably, yes. Okay. <laughs> so I said that I remember when the original building was built and um, you could not build a second story on top of that building. Um, would this new building be built so that if you ever wanted to move up, um, I know there's room to build out, but if you ever wanted to move up, that you could do that at some point way down the road. Right, and in, in the way, if you look at the um, the floor plan or the ground space plan that they provided, that's exactly how it was built, is the way everything, the support systems are designed, is that they, they support the current construction, but it makes logical sense if for some reason we were to completely balloon beyond that 85 and we had to add a secondary pod, it would be basically just blended to the right or to the left. So it allows for that quick pivot rather than again, as Administrator Feld said, you go up, now you incur the cost of elevators and all those support costs. So this with the footprint, with the space we have, again, that green space offers us the opportunity for that kind of lateral or, or you know, um, horizontal movement versus having to go up. Um, because once you go up, now you're adding staff because the same staff can't watch two levels. You're going to be adding infrastructure. So the idea is never have to go two stories. And that's why we've got that nice space of green space to be able to either go horizontal to the left or horizontal to the right and still be able to use the support areas that are already there and not having to add those as well. So really, I mean, the, the folks that are doing this, I'm really sometimes just amazed at the foresight and the lessons learned that we can benefit from that they've learned over the years. So some good questions. Um, and, and so, you know, look at those floor plans, look at those designs and sort of look at that from a long-term growth perspective. I think that that takes 
one into a discussion. If I can take you back to slide six, which talks about the process that um, you have us under contract, that slide six shows those three phases of work that, that we are under contract with you, um, the needs assessment. And then phase two was where we put together the budget information for these different options. And then of course, the recommendation for option seven, but the there is no floor plan in a sense. It's simply a diagram uh, to help identify and make sure that the land that's being considered is adequate in size and that I had something that I could give to our cost estimator who could have more than just a, a square foot number to put his, his estimates together. But I think, um, you know, part of the recommendation and a major reason uh, I think going forward is to get into that schematic design phase, which is, which is phase three, which is allows us to get into, into the details of the design, talk again, perhaps about a basement you know, have a floor plan that you can actually look at and talk about, understand where future expansion would take place, et cetera. And as I mentioned before, um, the commitment that you make to go into phase three does not obligate you at that point to fund the project. And can I say that, Sheriff? I mean, it's a fair statement, I think. So um, in as much as I think everyone on the study wants the project to continue to go past um, into the detailed design, the commitment that you're making uh, it, to go into phase three is, a sh is, 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 it's not the big bucks if you, if you follow what I'm but, saying. But there is a, there is a pretty significant cost to the taxpayers to move to the next phase. I mean, we would want to make sure we knew what we were doing. Yeah, there's a cost associated yeah. with that. Yeah. Yeah, do you know what that is offhand? Good question. I thought you might ask. Yes. I think I think yeah. I need to work with Scott and understand what the actual scope of that work would be. Um, and I think we'd start by defining what the word schematic means. Right. Yeah. My, my point is that the supervisor should understand if we go into that next phase, we really should kind of have somewhat of an idea of what we're doing because oh absolutely it would be, it and i would think be a significant cost to the taxpayers for nothing yeah for there's a nothing. cost yes yeah i mean as nice a guy as you are you're not doing that for just as sheriff josky pointed out just because he likes us <laughs> any other questions yes supervisor bullenweider so we are looking at a 52 bed facility expandable to 85 so my question is if we build a 52 bed facility or 52 inmates, 52 beds, how much is being built to be considered expandable? I mean, can we just build a 52 bed facility and we have real estate to add on? Or are we actually gonna have brick and mortar that is gonna be utilized in the future? So that's kind of what I spoke at earlier. When we talk about the 52, the 85 is within the confines of what's being put before you. That pod that you see is already expandable from the 52 up to the 85, merely through some anchor plates on the wall. Something as simple as so that. So it's brick and mortar, eighty-five. We're we're building right. Square so footage, we're building to the capacity of eighty-five, right? Because there, there's how do you say there's really no more cost to it. If we were to try to shoehorn it down and say we're only going to build a forty-five, when you look at what it would take to just build out that area square footage-wise, it's not a big cost versus doing what we're doing now and trying to shrink it down and then duplicating all that mortar. And but brick. I'm just curious if we were to do fifty-two bed facility, which exceeds our current needs. And you know we've looked at the growth uh, historically from back when we had this jail on the uh, supervisor's plates how many years ago, and we haven't gone way beyond that. So, and at the time they were also talking about renting beds, and that didn't go over very well. If exactly serves me. So I'd be curious to know what a 52 bed facility would actually cost. If if I may, Sheriff, if. if Supervisor Wolin Weider, if you go to uh, slide 37, uh, that probably does a good from a visual standpoint, is there's a difference between cells and beds. Uh, and uh, typically to provide uh, flexibility in, in both construction as well as housing of inmates, as you'll see, uh, you have and I can't even count exactly how many cells, but what happens more often than not is from a state statute standpoint is if you build a cell large enough, you are allowed to double bunk that cell 
how we would initially do it and how many counties have done it is they start with that cell first as a one bunk cell. And then if the population start, starts to expand beyond that, then as the sheriff said, we put up plates and we put a second bunk in that cell, which is absolutely allowed within, within state statute, which therefore allows us to go from 52 beds up to 85. So in your question regarding concrete, no more concrete needs to be poured. Instead, what this does, and the, the reason we're going with this is because of the magic number of 82, and 82 is, is projected 20 years from now. It's not projected right now. So if, we, if we're going right now with our average daily population of about 41, 42, a 52 bed should therefore be definitely adequate for our immediate needs. And then if we go to the 85 beds, that meets our magic 82 bed number 20 years from now. But I'm just saying that let's say then we went to 60 to keep it a round number, 60 bed facility that is doubled, mm -hmm. uh, you know, capacity, and it's not 85 brick and mortar expandable. You would literally have to expand the side of the building to go that much bigger. How much would it cost if we wanted a 60 bed max capacity facility? And and that we wouldn't have that number for because that, that to wasn't me is a number a little together. more realistic suiting our needs. If 20 years from now we need another 25 beds, we still have the opportunity to do that on that same site. Correct, we do. Otherwise, then, 20 years from now we're going to be putting a new roof on it. We're going to be fixing this, fixing that, and fixing that on something that we haven't needed for 20 years. Right. Well, now, so I'm going to make a couple points to that. First of all, <laughs> if you do it that way and you just think forward to the, the here and now, maybe even 10 years, um, it's not just adding another pod because you have to understand the, the operational aspect. Now we're going to have to double the staff. So while we may be doing ourselves a favor in the next 10 years, yeah, we're putting a heck of a burden on the next generation because we wanted to just do the minimum. Second point is that, yeah, that dead daily population that we're talking about now has been phased back for, you know, let's even we go back three years. We've known that the jail has been an issue for over 20. We know that. You know who else knows that? The judge, the DA, probation and parole. There's a lot of parts of our criminal justice system that we say have been adjusting to what we all know. You're only as good as your weakest link. The weakest link in our criminal justice system locally is our jail. So when the judge sits in front of a person and says, man, I'd really like to sentence this person to 90 days, but I know my jail can't hold it, he puts them on a, on a deferred prosecution. Maybe he just puts them out on a bond. We know that. We've had these conversations that this is going on. So once we actually have a suitable facility that everybody that's part of the criminal justice system can say, all right, now I can do my job, we're going to see some different numbers. So I don't want to say the numbers are suppressed, but they are because everybody knows the weakest link in our justice system. And for the judge to say, I'm going to be hard, tough on crime, he can't be tough on crime because there's nowhere to put him or the cost would be overbearing. So we've got to be careful, again, not to just, you know, see this far for the sake of our children. We got, we got to be able to throw a long ball here. We got to be able to do it. Now, I'm not saying to go over the top and spend excessively, but let's always make sure that we are not just thinking of the here and now um, because we've done that in other projects. We've seen other counties do that in other projects. And we've toured a lot of counties, and that was their regret, that they put together a building based on some solid recommendations, and people drew it back saying, man, if we could just save a couple bucks. And now they're in it for a year or two, and they're like, why? Why did we do that? Now we're, now we're literally burdened for the rest of the life of this building with that desire to try to save a few bucks. So again, I want to be frugal. I own a home as well in this county, all right? I pay taxes. I'm an elected official as you are, all right? So we're all accountable to people, but I'm all about leadership and I'm all about vision, all right? And if that means that somebody gets mad at me because they think I'm being excessive, I have to justify that. And that's where, as was stated, please tour the current jail once we open it up, because right now it's locked down. Uh, we're not letting anybody in uh, due to COVID. But once we open it up, please come take a tour, see what we've been living in for the last, you know, 50 years. Um, it, it's beyond, it's, it's, it's really remarkable. Um, there was actually a statement made when we did a justice and jail analysis four years ago. I started this process with an analysis. They went through and looked at everything. And this group of people said, we go around the county, or around the country, defending counties in regards to the operation and the resources in the jail. What we're seeing in Kiwani County, it's not defendable. And I was just blown away by that statement. They literally said, we, we wouldn't be able to defend you people. This is crazy how you're getting by in this jail. 
and I'm very proud of the men and women that work every day in it. We've done a great job. If you think of any operation in the county that, that, um, that has the greatest potential for litigation for lawsuits, what do you think it is? It's the jail. And how many lawsuits do you think we've had? All right, zero. And that's not because we have an amazing facility that takes into account state-of-the-art state equipment. No, it's because we have amazing men and women that work every day to mitigate all of these shortcomings in this facility. We're gonna to continue to do that. And I would rather us take the time now because we're in a very odd spot in our country and I get that. So this project's gonna hit a little roadblock, right? Let's use that time to get out there and educate, bring awareness, inform. That's what I really wanna do. So we're not in any huge hurry. We understand what everybody's going through, but for, you know, for heaven's sake, do not just put this on the back burner for another 20 years. Standing still is not an option. We've got to do it right for the sake of our children. And that's all I'm gonna say. Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Do we have uh, any, uh, anything on the whereabouts of Bug Tussle? We do not. We do not. Okay. Well, we'll move on to administrator's report then. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just have a couple items uh, for the board to be aware of. Uh, some of you may have seen the announcement. Uh, the Governor Evers had announced a routes to recovery uh, award to basically all local governments. Uh, Kiwani's, Kiwani County's allocation is $336,864. This has to be for unbudgeted government expenditures that are COVID related. So eventually what will be, what will be happening is uh, there will be requests to different committees on expenditures uh, for purchases of a variety of different things, whether that's cleaning supplies, whether that's some medical supplies, PPE, uh, other types of items. Uh, so those will be, uh, request for uh, expenditures and we would then need the committees and the finance committee and the board to approve those expenditures, but those expenditures would be reimbursed by this routes to recovery money. As we move forward, this is for expenses that have been uh, taken between March 1st and October 31st. So as we go through this process, you'll be getting more information, but I just wanted the board to be aware of that. And then the second item, for those of you that may not be aware, uh, the Public Service Commission has announced uh, their next round of broadband expansion grants. They'll be sending out the application materials on September 1st of this year. And then uh, the deadline to have those applications sent in will be December 1st. Again, there'll be another $24 million available uh, to be dispersed among uh, applicants that are awarded money. Um, as we move forward, uh, we will come to the board and see if a application should be submitted and what that would uh, look like. But I just wanted people to have a heads up as to those two items because those will be uh, possible expenditures coming before the board. If there's any questions that board members have on this or something else, I'm willing to answer as best I can. Scott, is that $336,000 only to be spent amongst the Kiwani County, like courthouse and human services and public health, or can that be distributed to the different municipalities, the EMS groups, the fire departments? Where, what is what is the parameters? Uh, routes to Recovery, Supervisor Kennard, is actually a gift that keeps on giving. The reason why I say that is every local government a municipal government within Kiwani County has received their own allocation. So the village of Casco has received an allocation, the city of Kiwani, uh, the town of Anapee, all towns, cities, and villages have received an allocation. And again, it has to be for unbudgeted government expenditures that are related to COVID. And it doesn't specifically have to be, um, while it can be a reimbursement for expenditures that have already happened after March 1st, they can also be for future expenditures. So if the, and I'm just gonna use it as an example, is if the city of Kiwani wanted to uh, purchase some more 
uh, cleaning supplies and PPE and the like for their uh, fire department and police department, and those could be reimbursable. They have to be COVID related and they have to be something that was not in their current budget. So there's a variety of different things. We're supposed to be getting an FAQ and more guidance from the state very shortly. But uh, what is very interesting as well is if you total up the, the amounts for all the cities, villages, and towns, that is approximately as well $336,863. So uh, the, the county has its allocation. Each, each city, town, and village has their allocation. Uh, I think this might be a good opportunity for all the local governments to kind of get together and talk about what types of expenditures may be needed for their municipalities because the other thing that can be done is that municipalities may are allowed to transfer uh, their balances or any portion of their balance to another municipal government if they see fit. That helps because the village of Casco, for instance, is getting $9,000. It's very yes. difficult with your own fire department and things like that. $9,000 goes nowhere. So. Cor correct. And that's where the convert and the biggest conversation is what do you purchase with it? And that's where uh, probably having a, a, um, a meeting with all the local officials regarding that and talking about that would be a good thing. And I'm more than willing to try to set something up with, with the village presidents and the town chairs if they would like. Right. Thank you. Supervisor Lukes. Uh, we had a town's association meeting last night and the subject came up and with Joel Kitchens and he's talking next fall, 90% of the ballots are gonna be mail-in ballots instead of people going to the polls. It's gonna cost more for our clerks, more work for our clerks. And we're looking at new election equipment coming up. Would some of that be possible to be covered? Again, uh, the and because uh, we've had some of these questions through the Wisconsin Counties Association, and I would have tried to uh, uh, been at the town unit meeting last night, but as you've seen, I've kind of been walking around because I threw out my back, so I apologize. Otherwise, I would have been there. Uh, again, if the government can show that it was not budgeted, that it's a government expenditure, and that it's related to COVID, then the likelihood of that being reimbursed is very strong. Uh, again, we, we haven't received yet the guidance, but uh, from my the phone conferences that I've been on, as long as you're being rational and reasonable in that request and can make a, a fairly strong case, then the likelihood of it being reimbursed is, is fairly high. Any other questions? Okay, we'll move on to committee reports for the sake of time and uh, rather than me listing off each one of these and then we sit here and have a Quaker prayer meeting after each one with everybody staring at me and no questions, I'm gonna take them all together at once. Are there any questions on any of the committee reports? You have uh, received the minutes beforehand. None on the reports, Mr. Chairman, but is can we get an update? At what point can we get an update from some of our directors? At where in the meeting? Yeah. You do that right now. Okay. I'd like to hear from Cindy where we are with COVID. I mean, it's still a hot topic. There's still some issues that are coming up now. So if you could tell us about numbers, some of the concerns that have she's been receiving from different people in the county. Mm -hmm. All right, can everyone hear me? Um, so you're still getting those daily updates. We're doing them on weekdays only right now instead of on weekends, partly because the state has stopped their weekend updates. So that's why I did. Um, but right now, currently in the county, we have 39 positive cases. Two of those are active. 36 have been cleared. We've had one death. We have no one hospitalized at this time. 1,273 negative cases, 32 are still pending. The majority of our cases fall under the age of 49. So we have a tie going between the age group of nine, 19 and 30 with 12 cases and 31 to 49 with 12 cases. The recent increase that we've seen is among the 19 to 30 year old group because the kids are going back out. So that's what we're finding is that kids are out and among their friends and we're seeing some of those cases go up. 
Um, other than that, uh, we have had no real kickback on our reopening guidelines that we put out. So we are trying to support as many agencies and organizations throughout the county as possible with giving them further guidance on how to go about making those guidelines work. Um, we're seeing more and more businesses, uh, churches, et cetera, open. Schools are starting to open up again for summer school in the next few weeks. Algoma is actually on a virtual uh, summer school plan right now. Luxembourg Casco is looking to go live at the end of July. So um, does anyone have any specific questions for me in regard to COVID at this point? Can you remind me, what is the uh, definition of uh, active? How many days is that? Two weeks or is it 30 days? It just days depends on their symptoms. Okay, so, so it's anyone who has active symptoms. They have to be 10 days from the start of their symptoms and then three days symptom free. So for some days, some people it's less or 10 days exactly. For some people it could be three to four weeks depending on how sick they are and how their symptoms um, progress. Okay. We did do some community testing last month. Um, we were up in Door County. We did a joint venture with Door County and the National Guard. Um, I did a big shout out in one of my newsletters to the National Guard. They were fantastic to work with. Um, we saw about 100 to 150 cases a day or people come through to be tested. They haven't given me an exact breakdown yet on how many were Kiwani County and how many were Door County. But if I had to guess, it would be probably more like one third Kiwani County, two thirds Door <clears throat> County. We did see people come from Marinette, Brown, Sheboygan. So we had some of the neighboring counties venture up to to be tested at that time. Out of that testing, we did see one positive case. Do you have any idea at this time, schools, what do you anticipate in the fall? The schools right now are openly discussing um, going back in fall. Uh, one of their biggest obstacles that they're looking at right now is busing in the guidelines that are tentatively being discussed by the state. They would allow approximately 13 children on a bus. So that would be each route would run six times to get the kids there. So when, that's a very tough obstacle to overcome. When would they start, 3 a.m.? <laughs> well, that's kind of what they're looking at. So I'm not sure how that's gonna work. The other questions that they have, some school officials feel very strongly about wearing PPE, some don't. So would they have kids mask, would they not? Uh, close proximity in classrooms is another concern. And then athletics has also been a hot topic. The WIAA um, has a uh, document, I believe, that will be coming out, or their, their document in regard in, in conjunction with DPI will be out, I believe, on the 22nd, which is on Monday. June 22nd. Yeah, so just... we're hoping to get further guidance, but that's just going to be guidance. It's not going to be set in stone. School districts are going to have to work through what they think is going to be best for each of their districts. So you anticipate that the DPI come fall, it will be just guidance or will they have requirements? Because it will schools, be guidance. On schools, as I understand it, they can place requirements. Mm, from what I've heard, they're talking guidance. But you don't anticipate just guidance at this point. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for Cindy? Thanks. Right. Thank you. Any other questions on any of the, uh, from any, for any committee? Yes, sir. Supervisor Augustine. Um, on the public health agenda this past week, there was something about an ordinance change. Uh, could somebody explain to me what that was or why that was on there and how that got on there? For changing the state emergency in Kiwani County. Public Health Supervisor Kroll. Um, it was put on the agenda um, and then I received the ordinance um, just to review it a couple days later. Um, when we brought it up for discussion, um, I really couldn't review. I only had the new one in front of me. I did not have the old one. Plus, I also did not have the resolution that we passed for the county to compare. So there were some questions that Jeff had brought up and Linda Teske. So I tabled it for discussion um, 
with Cindy in the health department um, and with um, Mr. Olson. Um, but that's as far as it's at right now, it's tabled and um, we will go through discussion on it. And I will note that I've talked to, um, uh, I got together before this meeting with uh, Supervisor Kroll, Supervisor Mastelier, and um, Jeff, uh, Scott, Cindy, and Tracy. Tracy. That's it. Um, and we talked about this and, um, you know, I think we'll be, you know, going forward. I just think it, uh, you know, it's a new board, new chairs. And um, I think that making sure that we um, let the committee chairs know what's being worked on, you know, ahead of, further ahead right away and um, making sure that we're communicating that. I think that will help all. I think that will help all of us. Um, so with the, we got a lot of new committee chairs and uh, I think we'll be, I think we'll do a better job going forward of uh, making sure that we don't uh, put things down that everybody's kind of surprised. You have anything to add further to that, uh, Supervisor Mastelier? Or? No. <laughs> okay, any other questions? All right, thank you. Um, is it okay if I drive on without a recess or? Yes. Let's go. Um, first reading of ordinance, we have none. Consideration of resolutions. Are we ready? Yes. A resolution in recognition of Kenneth Ken J. Tebon. Motion to approve the resolution. Motion from Supervisor Wagner, second by Supervisor Mastelier. Any questions? Any discussion? Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion passes. Next resolution, if you're ready. A resolution granting the petition of Bridge Aid, Town of Anape. Fiscal impact statement, 44,000 from County Aid Bridge Fund. This project is funded 20% locally, town and county, and 80% from federal dollars. Do I have a motion to approve? Supervisor Loops. Motion seconded by Supervisor Augustine. Any discussion? Any discussion? Seeing no, dis no questions. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Abstain. Abstain. Thank you, Supervisor Poppy. Abstain. Duly noted. If we're ready for the next resolution. Yes. A resolution authorizing deferral of revolving loan fund payments through September 30th, 2020. Fiscal impact statement. Some borrows, borrowers may elect to defer payments but ultimately they will be required to repay the loan. Any de decrease in cash flow will have no effect on the county as these funds are segregated. Do I have a motion? Supervisor Baker, second by Supervisor Lazansky. Any discussion? Any discussion? Seeing no discussion, all in favor of the resolution signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion passes. Communications, since there's uh, no ordinances, read it previous, we'll move on to communications, resolutions from other counties. Um, I have two resolutions, both from Wood County. The first one is to support the 116th Congress Senate Bill 3020 and House of Rep Bill 5516, the Commitment to Veteran Support and Out Outreach Act. And the, le the second one is request the state Senate to convene an extraordinary ses session to address the 13 water bills passed in the assembly earlier this year. Thank you. We move on to Kiwani County events or any announcements, comments? This is your chance, Supervisor Kennard. Any kind of events? Is that what this is about? That's yes. gonna be happening? Events right. or oh. anything you wanna say about any of the staff, positively. <laughs> No, I just want to mention some events that are coming up for the county. A lot of the parades are shut down this year with COVID going on. Uh, Village of Casco, uh, Lions, Casco Lions are holding their parade third weekend in August. So there will be a parade going through the Village of Casco. 
100 years for the village of Casco also, followed by the ball tournament and everything that goes on. Our Casco A's will be playing in the village and Luxembourg Casco High School Baseball will be coming to play in the village of Casco because the school field is not open in Luxembourg. And we also have a lot of the youth leagues that are coming to the village of Casco to play. So we're trying to accommodate as many public things as we can for the people. So Sounds like Casco is the place to be this summer. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Any other announcements? Yes, Supervisor Yonke. Don't forget about the races on Sunday night. Yeah, they look like they had a good crowd on Sunday. Um, if I mean, look to me like if you took into account the social distancing, they were as full, were they as full as they could be? Good crowd. They looked real good. Yep. What else can people do right now? You're right. <laughs> okay, well, that's very good for them. I was, I, I saw that and was, was very happy to see that. Anything else? All right, we'll move on um, to the next uh, future meeting dates. I do still have um, July 21st, that is still tentative. How long can I keep that July 21st on the, uh, before I have to uh, cancel? Till July 19th. So I may keep that on till July 19th. I, the reason that we've had that on hold, it was if we've received a contract uh, for uh, with bug tussle if we had something to consider in July, but obviously I would not uh, go forward with that unless we got that contract very soon. Um, that's a big contract and um, while I do, I am anxious to get this moving. I also want to make sure that we have um, an adequate amount of time for that to be reviewed by all of the supervisors and others that need to review that. So I don't know. I was hoping to know more tonight, but like you, I don't. Um, so July 21st is already scheduled. We are going to keep that for now. Um, August the 18th, that uh, too, is uh, already down. And August the 18th, to clarify location, do we know? Or should we leave that uh, So location, Supervisor Yankee, to be determined. So if you drive to Kiwani on August the 18th and we're not there, you know where to find us. The um, September 15th then, I would need a motion uh, to set the September 15th, that is proposed September 15th, uh, motion by Supervisor Volenweider, um, second by Supervisor Poppy. Any uh, discussion on that? Seeing no discussion, uh, all in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion passes. Supervisor Wagner. Motion to adjourn. Second. Second by Supervisor Volenweider. Anybody uh, discussion? All right, motion to adjourn. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Same, uh, those opposed, same sign. Supervisor Bastler, you are opposed. Duly noted, motion passes.